unexplored worlds still exist, where intelligent beings lead mysterious lives. We know them in fleeting glimpses, shadows of their true identity. Moving separately, yet linked to each other in ancient societies, they travel through landscapes of water and air. We yearn to know more of their hidden lives, to somehow share their exuberant spirit as they have touched our imagination. Shaped by different elements, we share the same warm-blooded needs and pleasures. Our inventions allow us closer contact, but the effects are unpredictable. We search the heavens for intelligent life, but overlook entire nations below us, societies as complex as our own. Crossing into worlds where neither can linger, we have barely just met in chance encounters. To the ancient mariner, the first glimpse of a whale's exploding breath must have evoked sheer terror, the fear of an immensely powerful being surfacing from the depths of the underworld. Slaughtered or stranded on beaches, it was only in death that its full measure was revealed. 100 feet long, 180 tons of mystery. Their lifeless bodies have provided us a catalog of parts, an inventory of flesh and bone. But how do they live? To truly understand them, we must enter their world. Forty miles off the Bahama coast, Cousteau divers are joined by a pod of wild spotted dolphins. Theirs is a highly social existence individuals bound to one another in a complex web of relationships. In this three-dimensional world, predators can appear from any direction, and being part of the group is essential to the survival of the individual. Navigators, guardians, hunters, and teachers, each has a social role which benefits the pod. Mothers teach their spotless babies to hunt with sound for prey hidden in the sand. Each youngster learns its own unique whistle, an acoustic signature which identifies the individual within the extended family. 
Communication and cooperation are as vital in this environment as is their link to the world of air. Even the synchrony of their rising together to breathe reinforces their bonds to each other. But despite the serious nature of their social roles, they all have time to play. Theirs is a world of community, dominated by the need to associate one with the other. They are less than complete when separated or alone. An exception is Jojo a lone bottlenose dolphin whose solitary behavior is a mystery. Since 1980, he has regularly sought human companionship at a busy Caribbean resort. What is the explanation for such a maverick? Not behaving like an animal trained in captivity, nor looking for a handout, Jojo is wild and unpredictable. If touched, he responds with a nip or a tail slap. The games are played by his rules. It's Jojo who seems to be on vacation as he mimics the divers and their bursts of bubbles. Fascinated by motors, Jojo rushes to the surface for a quick breath of air before teasing the divers in a game of tag, made possible only by the speed of their scooters. His body bears scars from life-threatening encounters with boat props and jet skis. But Jojo is irresistibly attracted to the mechanized toys of modern civilization. Does he roll in imitation of the scooter's whirling props? Why does Jojo choose human companionship? Does simple curiosity draw him to us? as we are drawn to him? Or does strict dolphin society demand conformity and drive away the eccentric? To learn more about wild dolphins, Jean-Michel Cousteau comes to meet Jojo with a family friend, 12-year-old Christine Preslin. Despite our short time with Jojo, his behavior shows us that even the lone renegade must follow certain dolphin rules. We find ourselves participating in an impromptu experiment. Christine enters a cave in the reef and waits for Jojo to follow. We suspect he won't swim under anything that blocks his access to the surface. At least every 10 minutes, he must take a breath of air and will not risk being trapped. He waits in obvious agitation, almost scolding such foolishness, then leads her to light. 
and life. Half a world away, we prepare a decompression chamber as a safety precaution for a deep cave dive. Unlike the whale or dolphin, we require complex technology to endure the physical stress of diving to great depth. We've heard a rumor of whale bones deep in a cave. Why would they have entered such a place when it could cost them their lives? We set sail from Fiji in search of the remote cave. As we go down and enter the cave, I want everybody to hug the top of the cave. That'll put us in at about 160 foot. 160 Expedition leader Don Senti has planned this dive to the half minute. At a depth of 200 feet, timing is critical. The divers will carry backup lights, double tanks, and the additional gear which will ensure our safety. We will be diving under six atmospheres of pressure and in complete darkness. There is no margin for error. In the shallow waters above the reef, we descend, trailing behind us hundreds of feet of lighting cable, a way to illuminate the recesses below and our lifeline to the surface. The massive reef drops below us. At 160 feet, we locate the entrance, a gaping hole 50 feet across. The cave itself is an ancient tomb. The accumulated remains of prehistoric corals and jagged volcanic rock. As we go deeper into the twisting labyrinth, the thought of whales entering these constricted tunnels becomes more and more a puzzle. Was it curiosity? Were they chasing food? It seems a home only to scavengers. Mark Bessington finds part of a skull resting upside down. Its ghostly stare comes not from eye sockets, but from holes for muscles that once closed powerful jaws. In this cramped space, the whale surely would have drowned. Buried in the rubble are other bones. Blessington reverses direction, something a whale is unable to do perhaps an explanation of why the cave is such a deadly trap. He continues the macabre search. In the distance, an earthquake, a chilling sound. Is it possible the whales were cut off from life trapped in a sudden moment of geologic change. Struggling through a narrow opening more than 200 feet within the cave, Blessington searches another hidden chamber. His lights reveal a pile of tangled vertebrae. Above, on the ledge, rest more skulls. True to their social nature, they were not alone. Mute sentinels, they guard their secret and tomb together. From photographs, we solve one mystery. The bones are identified as pilot whales.
Off the northwest coast of Africa, near Tenerife Island, a group of short-finned pilot whales congregate. To study the behavior of animals that live in the open sea, this is the perfect natural laboratory. Usually elusive, the whales are difficult to approach. Called whales, they are actually large dolphins, 20 feet long and weighing up to three tons. But what is more intriguing are their extraordinary bonds to each other, family ties that last as long as they live. Pilot whale society revolves around the mother. Generations of children never leave her side. Sons go away only long enough to mate outside the pod and never know the identity of their offspring. Since they cannot protect their own children, males become protective uncles, guarding the safety of their closest maternal relatives, all directly linked to the matriarch of the pod. Only one land animal lives in such a society. Also mammals, they are tribal humans. I understand why, for them, separation from each other is unimaginable in this wild expanse. In a world where sound will carry when sight is obscured, voices are their link, their contact with each other. Yves Lotnika prepares to listen in on their language. Do they use sound to coordinate hunting as they spread out to locate prey? Or do calls of alarm alert the larger males to danger? Now they face new threats. Our numbers grow, and so does our curiosity. Do we risk loving to death these animals we barely know. In a heavily traveled area off the coast of Hawaii, unusually bold pilot whales approach a zodiac. As the boat stops, so do the whales. Lisa Costello enters the water while her companion films the interaction. You've, you've gone through uh, a very unique experience with people who uh, have never had a chance to approach these animals so close. And in your case, you were able to really get very, very close. Any idea why they were doing this? The only thing, and this is strictly speculation on my part, is that they were in their social hour. They were not feeding. When I got in the water, this large male came right directly up to me and stopped. And, and was just looking at me, and I was looking at him, a lot of eye contact. Then the unexpected happens. She breaks free. But the whale reclaims her. Do you think that he sensed that something was wrong with you? Yes, I do. I'm sure my, I was projecting a lot of fear because I could not breathe, and I think he sensed that. If I hadn't got, gotten up probably in the surface in the next couple seconds, I don't think I would have made it. An attack or affection gone wrong? What is their true nature?
Pilot whales mass strand and die more than any other whale or dolphin. Why? Cousteau seeks answers from Dr. Charles Mayo of the Center for Coastal Studies. From this point, several miles each side uh, is the area where most of the stranding on Cape Cod occurs, and in fact, probably most of the stranding in the Northern Hemisphere. Do you have any explanations as to why they strand here? At our present state of knowledge, we don't uh, understand either the phenomenon of stranding, what brings them to the beach, or, um, quite honestly, the prognosis for animals that uh, are on the beach. We're recording a stranding here. Going on to the beach. Can we get in front of them? Yeah, Yell and scream or something. Mayo's video camera documents the action. A useful tool for the scientist, the video can later be analyzed in a less frantic moment. In this same location, 200 years ago, pilot whales were slaughtered. Now volunteers desperately try to drive them back to sea. What force overrules their will to save themselves? Are they sick or lost? Are disoriented leaders followed by the others, risking death over separation? A decision is made to euthanize the largest and sickest animals. Why do we decide to put this one away and keep this one alive and release this one or put that one in captivity? Well, I think just by the fact that we intervene and decide to do any of those things, uh, some could say we're, we're uh, playing God a bit. There are many issues that are involved, not the least of which is whether we should intervene at all. But once we say we will intervene, I think we should ask the question, do we really have reason to put any of them down, or should we at least understand the phenomenon better before we start doing that? Their behavior disturbs us, perhaps a reflection of our own fear of death. Okay. They have, after all, been stranding for at least 30 million years. With several individuals removed from the pod, the remaining whales leave and are monitored with radio tags. They are tracked for two weeks in a rare and successful rescue of stranded whales from the beach. But why they strand remains a mystery. Another enigma may be solved by space age technology. Scientist Jeff Goodyear assembles a satellite tag the device is able to transmit information about water temperature, number of dives, and continually monitors location. The 10-ounce tag will be attached to a 50-ton whale. It seems ironic that although we have launched satellites into space, we still don't know the migratory route of one of the world's most endangered species, the humpback whale. Every year, they travel from Alaska to breeding grounds in Mexico, Hawaii, and Japan, and then back, 7,000 miles round trip. There is a need to know the course of their migration. Once masters of the open sea, whales must now navigate a maze of nearly invisible and deadly walls. Every individual counts in their severely diminished population. Goodyear applies an antibiotic to prevent any chance of infection. A crew from seven nations will study this cosmopolitan whale off Mexico's Socorro Island. On this breeding ground, little is known of the well-named humpback. Competing to mate, bull males explode from the sea. 
courtship by one of the largest creatures ever to inhabit the Earth is not a gentle affair. Placing a tag in a whirlpool of whales is almost impossible. Below the ship, the object of the competition has other concerns, her one-ton newborn calf. A visit from such innocent new life charms us. But we are concerned for its safety so close to our boat. A tiny breath. Then the infant returns to its massive mother, immersed in the songs of ardent suitors. In this dense liquid medium, the whales feel sound waves as well as hear them epic arias which may caress, as well as carry meaning. Whether to attract a mate or intimidate a competitor, they all sing the same song. A large escort blows a stream of bubbles, a rising curtain of air that obscures mother and baby. 30 years ago, we knew how to hunt them to near extinction. But how do we assure their safe passage into the 21st century? As each day passes, fewer and fewer whales are sighted as they embark to leave on their long journey north. Goodyear must quickly choose from fewer individuals. The first tag is a test of the attachment apparatus that will carry the satellite device and contains a VHF transmitter. Whales up. Five beeps at 13001. The crew follows the whale into the night. Whales up. Eight beeps, 185820. Probably a kilometer off, uh, just right off the bow. Over. It is the first time a Pacific humpback is tracked for depth. Thought to fast in southern waters, the whale dives to nearly 400 feet, deep enough to find prey. Unexpectedly, the signal stops, and the whale disappears out of range, the only Socorro whale to be tagged. Having eaten little, if anything, while breeding and calving, the whale migrated north to feast in nutrient-rich waters. Most will spend approximately six months, from June to December, refueling for the season ahead. The Cousteau team joins the hungry whales of southeast Alaska, hoping that, preoccupied with feeding, they will permit closer contact and tagging will be possible. Oh, there's whales there.
Each breath brings the tags to the surface, where transmitters beam the whale's exact location to an orbiting satellite and back to Goodyear. Collecting data on their movements, he begins to plot their path. The tagged whales stay nearby on the feeding grounds, following schools of fish, sand lance and herring, also engaged in their own feeding frenzy. Whales mow a harvest of fish in schools that can be 300 feet deep and two to three miles long. Gaping mouths encompass two tons of fish and water per mouthful, filtered into a ton of food eaten every day. Trumpeting and lunging, they join together to corral the fish in nets of bubbles. The seas small and abundant sustain the planet's largest. The tag stopped transmitting after five days. And with the help of local researcher Jan Straley, the team turns to photo identification to track the whales. Joined by Jorge Urban with his knowledge of the Socorro whales, they meet to compare photo IDs. For me, it looks very similar to the ones with Southeast. We saw this whale today. To follow an international whale, researchers cross human borders of language and diplomacy to share information. She was up further north. The patterns of the 12-foot flukes are as individual as human fingerprints. Sally Mizrock and researchers throughout the North Pacific have identified more than 2,000 humpbacks in a computerized catalog. Worldwide, this program represents the largest tracking study ever attempted on a free-ranging mammal. Comparing fluke photos from different locations, a match is made between Alaska and Hawaii. Eventually, satellite tagging may reveal their migratory pathways. But a deeper mystery is how humpback whales navigate thousands of miles in open seas. They may sense magnetic fields or follow the position of sun and stars. Perhaps they are guided by the topography of undersea canyons and mountains. Passing through various latitudes, do they sense changes in seawater, temperature, or taste? Or so in undersea currents, flippers extended in aquatic flight. It remains their secret. In Hawaii, we witness an urgent ballet of lust, 14 bulls pursuing one elusive female. They leave a haunting question. With such a desire to reproduce, why after 30 years of protection are they still endangered? In the lagoons of Mexico's Baja Peninsula, sanctuaries protect the threatened gray whale. Banned from casting their nets during the breeding and calving season, Local fishermen have turned their bad fortune into good business. 
Whales are now more valuable alive than dead, especially with a boat full of tourists. This friendly scene contradicts tales of early whalers who called the greys devilfish, demons that crushed boats and bodies in a slaughter that turned the lagoons blood red. The reckless hunt began in 1857 when Charles Melville Scammon sailed into a breeding lagoon and described whales huddled together so thickly that it was difficult for a boat to cross the waters. She's at the front, at the front. The Greys responded to their attackers with unexpected vengeance. Where is she? Terrified boat. whalers reacted with calculated tactics. Calves were harpooned, baiting frantic mothers to their death. Okay. Ten years later, Scammon wondered whether this mammal will not be numbered among the extinct species of the Pacific. Whether forgetfulness or forgiveness, it is an act of amazing grace that they approach us at all. The phenomenon of the friendly whale may be more a change in our behavior than in theirs. Look, look at the calf. They come to us with their calves and what may be learning overriding instinct. With a brief introduction, this friendly relationship is passed on to another generation. One third of the newborns won't survive the hardship of their first year, but those who do won't be afraid of boats or people. At sea level, it's impossible to see the growing concentration of gray whales in Baja. Cousteau takes off on an aerial survey to observe the whales and to record their numbers high over Magdalena Bay, the first lagoon to be decimated by the early whalers. 50 years of international protection have worked. I count 56 grays. The lagoons of Baja are again filled with life. They are the first great whale to be taken off the endangered species list. Will their new status revive international arguments over whether to resume the hunt? Or is this a second chance for us to finally get to know them? Few people have ever been diving with gray whales. We've come to see what had almost been lost forever to experience the gray whale in its own element. The first view is dreamlike, a landscape of whales. They are living fossils, unchanged for half a million years. we come across a whale head down in the sand. Is it feeding or sick or about to give birth? Knowing so little of its natural behavior, we can only bear witness.
They touch, caressing with flippers, concealing bones like ancient hands. In primitive procession, they pass, aware of our presence. Caught in their gaze, we understand what we share. A need for others, warm blood, to breathe. Our differences appear great, but each breath reaffirms our link in the vast diversity of life. Poets best imagine their grandeur, they flow like breathing planets. One hallmark of intelligence is a range of activity beyond mere survival. Culture, communication, recognition of the individual, and play. These are characteristics we generally reserve for ourselves, but we are not alone. In Baja, the whales are surfing. I join old friends with a song to celebrate the whales. She is just another creature, mother to a gifted child, giving life to life forever, forever free, running wild, running with a brighter vision, singing with a clearer voice, dancing on the open water. Each and every one together sing in peaceful harmony For ourselves and for each other, for the earth and for the sea Through a liquid looking glass, we have seen complex lives that mirror our own Individuals in cooperative societies, kindred spirits we've barely just met our numbers increase, and in our massive wake, theirs decline. Can we protect what we do not yet fully understand? The lingering mystery may be not their nature, but our own. <laughs> 